<laughs> so I hit the button. <laughs> okay, we're recording. All right. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. This is Night Flight. And today I have a, another session with James True. His website is jtrue.com. His bio will be in the description box. He is the author of Blueprints of Mind Control, Spell of the Six Dragons. And he has a new book, which is very fitting for our talk today. And that is The Technology of Belief. So, James, welcome. Yeah, it's great to be back. Nice to see you again, Judith. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you are doing this uh, with me. And today we are going to hammer it home, politics. All right the belief in authority and politics it's never getting old so <clears throat> what do you think where does that come from um <clears throat> so if if you trace back uh belief technology from the earliest forms of recorded history that we have um you'll see that that underneath all of these different uh costumes uh, belief is dressed in a style and a fashion that fits the times. Uh, my book actually just outlines this. It's taking you from scene to scene throughout history and showing you this is what belief looked like uh, during the Oracle at Delphi. For like a thousand years, uh, the Mediterranean was uh, technically ruled by an oracle, a, a literal virgin placed on a pedestal and gassed from, from this strange uh, ethanol, that they, they call it ethanol deposits, but the point was that she would enter into a meditative state and would give kings and queens answers to, to their life, uh, their, their life. Uh, people would come from uh, far, far away to come to uh, Delphi and wait in line for only for a hope, only for the opportunity to possibly get to see the oracle. These were like full moon ceremonies, so it was like only 13 of them a year. And uh, it was a really honor just to get inside. So if you start to look at that technology, um, it, it, it creates a, uh, uh, a bottleneck where people are competing to have the ear of, of Delphi, of the Oracle. And this really is the heart of what drives belief technology. And it's something that I've traced throughout history. So not only does it go to Oracle of Delphi, but that exact same bottleneck happens in Egypt uh, with Cleopatra. The exact same bottleneck happens with Julius Caesar in Rome. Uh, that exact same bottleneck um, rebuilds the Catholic Church. It uh, sets up uh, Sabbatai Zebi and the inversion of Judaism. It goes into Frankism. It moves into World War I and World War II. And then now you're looking at something that's a little bit dressed differently. Now it's a political movement. It's not a personal intuition movement. It's not a deeply religious movement. It's now a political movement. And from that, now our modern day saints would be the stars that we'd see on, on television or the ones that we see in the movie theater. These are our, our archetypes which is no different than the, uh, the saints that we would call holy um, and, and dress them on our buildings like Notre Dame and things like that. So the book is just trying to show, look, there's always a costume on side of belief. That's kind of like one half of the book. But then the other half is really telling you how important and how beautiful belief is. We are shaming belief constantly day to day. We're actually told to, to, that to not believe is good. That's what caused atheism to really emerge, I think, on the main stage. It became more fashionable to have a very uh, 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 curtailed belief. And, and in my opinion, that is another form of gelding the psyche, of, of disconnecting our power. Um, our prana gets, gets, uh, gets its balls cut off. And uh, it does this through different history. We're bottlenecked. We're put into one central location. So th this book is just trying to expose all of that, to, just to really look at this thing throughout history and how it functions now. And more importantly, why it's doing such a wonderful job of choking us all out right now, you know, as a species. Because the, the entire system is going into this control of one central 
place, one Lord, one world, one court, one, one answer, one, one people. Where we go one, we go all. Uh, there is a constant push into the exact same pit of a centralized belief structure where a committee of people get to dictate, here are all the acceptable beliefs that all of you can have. Uh, that's really what, what's happening to us for, for the last 5,000 years. Yeah. And we also had in history this divine right to rule. And, but I think not much has changed since then because people, no matter how they label themselves, yeah, they, they have that belief in government, in authority. And that is really hard to kill. Mm -hmm. Because even those who say, yeah, I'm an anarchist, <laughs> I don't vote. <laughs> All of a sudden you see them um, supporting um, different parties, so-called alternative parties. Yeah, there is no such thing as an alternative party because <clears throat> at the top, they are all joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. You always get the same. It's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you think you do something differently, but mm -mm, the same nonsense plays out again and again and again, and we are feeding it. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so two things on that. The, <clears throat> it's really important that we understand that no one actually wants to be ruled. <laughs> what, what, what really happens is, is that they don't want to be in charge. Mm. So it, it, it's, that's why it's never going to appeal to people to tell them, um, well, you need to abandon your, your political beliefs or you need to stop supporting the state. You're never going to be able to convince someone to stop believing something. All you can do is show them where a better, more fashionable way of redirecting their belief is. That's the only way positive change will actually happen. You're not going to be able to shut that belief off. You're only going to be able to say, hey, why don't you point it this way? Oh, that's totally different. And getting people to point that into their own feet, into their own spine, their own back, is really what we're looking at. Um, we pretend that slavery is this awful, horrible, menacing thing that only attacks race and, and it has this evil connotation and people are enslaved against their will. And Judith, it's just never happened that way. If you were to go back through history, if you were to look at Rome, for example, you have an entire thriving economy that's built on top of a slavery system. And this was a system that, that was profitable and worked. Um, there was upward mobility that was created in Rome through slavery. People were coming into the city, entering into a slavery contract, and that contract had a release date based on certain conditions that were met. This exact same model has been carried over, for example, into America. Um, when the settlers, what we're calling settlers, were setting up America, really it's countless stories of people that were coming to a blacksmith or, or a farmer or someone with a house and saying, look, I don't have any shoes. Winter's coming. I'm, I'm fucked, man. Can I be your slave? Like, can I do that? And, and that's the term indentured servant. And for seven years, that person would, would become basically uh, a farmhand, no different than an animal, a beast of burden for that person. But throughout their slavery, they would, do, they would build their own blacksmithing tools, for example. If they were a blacksmith, they, they were building their own blacksmithing tools. If they were uh, a farmer, they were learning techniques about how to harvest and, and salvage different kind of things. It was a symbiotic relationship, the same symbiotic relationship that was in Rome, the same symbiotic relationship, sadly, that we have now, where all of us are going out pretending to vote pretending to have this thing happen where, where you, you, you're supposedly exercising your sense of freedom or democracy. It's, it's the exact same crutch. It's the exact same thing 
it, what it really boils down to is people are afraid of ruling themselves. People are afraid of trusting themselves. They, they would rather have someone else take care of them because it's winter time because it's freaking cold and they don't have shoes. And as long as you can create a, a situation where it's always cold, where there's always dissonance, where, where there's always strife, you're going to always have a culture that, that creates slavery, no matter how much they try and pretend that they hate it, no matter how much they try and claim that they are the champion of ending slavery. It's literally the exact opposite. This is how we lie to ourselves in public. And we are living in a public that is full of people that lie to themselves. So when, when you start to tell the truth, it becomes very awkward and cumbersome and uncomfortable for people. And that's really why I wrote that book, The Technology of Belief, because it's, it's to expose that, look, you're not going to reason with these people. You're dealing with people that want to be slaves. You, you're, that's, that's your base uh, building block. You, you, can't, you can't pretend like that this is something different. Yes, you can install sovereignty into people, but the only way it's going to happen is you have to make it fashionable. Um, I firmly believe that. In fact, one of my chapters talks about uh, Louis Bourgeois, this famous sculptor that did all these giant spiders that were built all around the planet. These are like three-story tall, four-story tall bronze spiders. She did a lot of art where there's like cannibalism and mutilation and stuff. She was making it fashionable. Um, she was accessing the primal urge to devour each other, to, to create this uh, blackmail system that we're calling our government right now. It, it's, uh, all these are belief technologies that, that really go deep into understanding why we do what we do, uh, how this whole world works. So the, the, the book really does just try and take you, transport you, you know, now you're in ancient Rome. Now you're looking at Cleopatra. Now you're looking at the Oracle of Delphi. Now you're in a cage <laughs> underneath Paris. Now you're looking at Hitler. Now you're looking at, at uh, Rockefeller. All these people have, have been producing this same globalistic way. And the reason why that's feeding so well, the reason why that drug is such a powerful heroin is because so many of us want to be a slave. We are too afraid of our own autonomy. And that's the only reason why it's working. That's the only reason why this is a profitable system the, the, the way it is now. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing more tragic than an Agent Smith who thinks he is awake. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but James, if I vote libertarian. I don't know if you can hear me, but the, <clears throat> what? the my video feed cut off. Wait, okay. there you are. I'm sorry, I missed all that, Judith. The, the video stream cut off. Okay. I said, nothing more tragic than an Agent Smith who thinks he is awake. Yeah, that's our <laughs> biggest problem. The Agent Smiths are out there pretending to, to tell us everything's okay. They're out there right now insisting that everything's okay. You're going to be great. This is fabulous. Uh, miracles are happening every day. The chemtrails have vitamins. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Someone is saying that right now. Someone with hundreds of thousands of, of views and supporters is telling people that, hey, guess what, guys? All the chemtrails are now fine. They're actually fortified with vitamins now. And he wasn't kidding. Like, mm. he wasn't kidding. This is Cyril Brain 2. And he, he does these videos now on YouTube where someone else does them with him. But again, it's another anonymous account. So it's another person behind a curtain that you can never hold accountable. You can never say, hey, you lied to me last month. I would like to hold you accountable for that. You can never do that. It's another oracle at Delphi, except for he gets to hold a sheet over his head the whole time. And he gets to pass out these little whispers telling you everything's okay. Trust the plan. Trust the plan. Trust it's it's freaking yeah. madness. It's, it's madness. And uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a fight that we're losing right now. Because so many just want to be slaves. They just prefer it. Yeah. But James, if I vote libertarian, look here. Yeah. Mr. Texas, yeah. he promises that. Yeah. Then yeah, it I, will I, be okay. Or yeah. not? And those are all different phases that we go through. Um, <laughs> I was a libertarian. I was my county uh, representative um, mm. 
for libertarian for a while before I got where I am now. Like the last presidential election, actually, I was pushing a libertarian candidate. I wanted America to have more than two choices. Israel has 42 candidates in their last election. America has two. Um, I, I, I was still thinking that the system itself was intrinsically good. It was just corrupt. That's what I used to think. Um, I see things more clearly now. I understand that if media has never once ever, ever questioned the electoral college, maybe we should look at, maybe that's not legit. You know, uh, we, we elect our president over here, Republic through the electoral college. None of us are allowed to audit those people. I don't even know who that is. I don't even know who that person is. And it's the same media that lies to us. that's telling us, oh, this is how everyone voted. There's, you really have no freaking idea. And that's why every election is considered a, uh, oh, it's so close. Oh, oh, it's so <laughs> close. And we're supposed to pretend that it really was the one great guy against the one bad guy every time. But, but we just keep missing it. Just, and if next time, if we just try harder. This is yeah. the carrot on the stick in front of the donkey. This is how you lie to yourself. And more importantly, this isn't, this isn't how we're deceived, Judith. This is how we are allowing our, this is the excuse we cling to so we can stay seated inside our stockade. It, it, we want to keep rowing this ship. We want to fucking sit in that Viking chair and go, oh, oh whip me, whip me harder. Oh, whip me even harder. And so we're going to look for an excuse to stay. And so if there's a television set inside where you're pushing, the, you're, you're going to say, I'm not getting up. The, my show's on. We'll liberate tomorrow. Oprah's on. It, it's that's literally what's happening is is that we're th this isn't because people are fooled it's not it's because mm -hmm. people are comfortable because people are too afraid to take that belief off of one thing and move it back to themselves that scares the shit out of them that's a lot that's a lot for them to have to suddenly deal with and most just just don't want to do it mm -hmm. they'll tell you they do you know they'll go out and tell you oh uh, I'm an anarchist. They'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, it, 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 people are going to tell you things anyway. It, people are, that's all we do is lie to each other right now. That's why one of the chapters in my book is called The Prana Economy. It it's really is trying to look at what is the energy underneath between people? Because really underneath, there's a transaction that's happening. And it's completely opposite of what our words are saying. You know, our words are saying I'm an anarchist. But underneath, it's saying... He gives me water, I get to watch TV, <laughs> and I get some mutton every Tuesday. And all I have to do is keep rowing. All I have to do is just keep rowing. That's it. it the prana economy underneath says I'm comfortable here. Everything's fine. So I can complain because I want to I look hip. But the second someone brings up a real solution, that I, I got I to gotta shoot that in the head. It's like, well, what, what are you doing bringing a saw in? I'm like, well, we can cut the chain off. Oh, well, hey, this guy's got a saw. This guy's got a saw. Then the whole time he's like, you're not trusting the plan. No, no, no. We, see, that jailer is actually on our side. And he's going to release us. And you're going to screw it all up if you try and save us right now. You're going to screw it all up. Like, that's what's happening right now. It's freaking madmen insisting that they're the heroes. It, it's, it's Stockholm Syndrome. It's such a bad, bad, bad case of that. Yeah. If only, if only, if only we can vote in the right guys and girls. That belief yeah. is, that is so persistent, it never dies. James? Uh, hmm. That's the key to two towers. The oldest spell that I've seen cast on us is done by two towers. Uh, it's the idea of creating um, a good guy and a bad guy. You create a hypnotic spell where you're, here's your good guy, here's your bad guy. And now your entire thinking is now completely in between these two guys. <laughs> and the, the solution's out here, but you can't get there because you're between two towers. You're literally trapped between two ideas of good and bad. That's what Julian Assange is right now. Julian Assange is supposed to be the messiah of truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's supposed to have somehow survived. Keep in mind, we're dealing with, with people that, that probably have energy weapons, that probably do chemtrails, 
cells that probably do underground bases. And we're supposed to believe that an Ecuadorian embassy in, in literally the, the, the world's most evil city that's ever been <laughs> formed and, and that somehow a pane of glass was to always keep him alive. Somehow he was still able to stay alive. And now we're bringing him out just like Joe versus the volcano. We, we, we've dressed our virgin up like in King Kong and we've praised her. We, we've put a lot of fruits and apricots all around her and we're calling her the Messiah of truth. And really what we're going to do is we're going to dump her in the fucking volcano. We're going to try and make the, the King Kong leave us alone by giving them something else. And that's why Julian Assange says, I, I will never entertain any thoughts of 9-11 conspiracies. That's why he's saying, I found secret information. This is a Saudi hit. And that's why just last night, Judith, and keep in mind, uh, Julian Assange said years ago, no, no, it's Saudi now. It's Saudi did 9-11. That's who did it. And just last night, Tulsi Gabbard, she's supposed to be the other tower, like the complete <laughs> antithesis of Trump. And just last night, she's on TV saying, 9-11, there's a truth we need to uncover about 9-11. And I, so I'm like, I lean up. I'm like, oh, my God, she's about to say. And, and then what is the next thing that comes out of her mouth? It was Saudi. Yeah, yeah. We, we have to uncover what Saudi did. So you have these two towers now. And you're, you're always between these two towers. Mm. It, it, this isn't going to end until we get out of the van. This, isn't, this is not, not going to get better until we want it to become, we want to stop being slaves. It's the only way. Because right now everyone wants it. They're fine. That's why they're feeding us Epstein. We're like, oh, yeah, we're really exposing the media now. And it's <laughs> like the whole time no one's talking about 9-11 because we're talking about a about Epstein right now, who wasn't even a real billionaire. Like he wasn't even a real billionaire. It's, it's, it's so frustrating. Yeah, that's true. And uh, my, I have to say my patience is uh, running low right now. Mm -hmm. I'm at a point where I no longer have time for this nonsense. You know why? Yeah. We are very late in the game. And I somehow feel it's, make it or break it mm -hmm. and that has a lot to do with coming to our senses coming to know ourselves and taking back our own power and we have been indoctrinated even sometimes in the womb <laughs> while mm -hmm. we were still in the womb that we do not have any power Mm -hmm. We are useless, we are worthless, we are problematic, mm -hmm. and on and on it goes. And the, the only reason why that feeling works is because it's safe. So many mm -hmm. people feel safer saying, well, I'm worthless because I'm too dangerous if not. My carbon footprint's so dirty. My, <laughs> my racism is so bad. My sexism is just off the charts. My xenophobia is just completely, completely out of control. <laughs> I, 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 you need to chain me down and give me an oar and I, I, give me something to do. The, 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 this is why it, we, we would prefer this. We, we would, most of us would prefer this. And, and this is not, this doesn't mean we're broken. I think this is why we're here. I think we are here to refine ourselves, to alchemically change from lead to gold, from slave to sovereign. Mm -hmm. If you Look at what a baby does. A baby first, first tries to learn how to crawl, and he's crawling around. He's crawling. He's doing stuff. Then he tries to stand. But the only way he could stand, there's only one way he could stand. He's going to be clinging to something else. And, and as he's clinging, he's kind of like, you know, he's keeping his way up. But he's not, he's not fully standing yet. He needs, he needs a master to help him. And I really do think that, uh, that what we're seeing, the reason why we've seen slavery as an economy, not, not necessarily a, oh, it's because we hate humanity. No, I think it's actually a natural function of developing sovereignty, of learning to crawl, to walk, to finally stand on your own. And, and what's really happening is, is that just some of us are standing on our own now, but most of us aren't. Mm. And there are people that are standing on their own that make a shitload of profit selling crutches to the people that, that want to learn how to stand. 
and they don't want they don't want that to be a cure they want that to be a monthly service you know they want their crutch to be a monthly service and guess what that's just fine because imagine if you were a baby and you could learn as long as you could hold on to someone's hand it, it, what if you just never never lost that hand what if that hand was always there it, you, you would never really have to learn how to walk. You would just, well, as long as there's a hand around, I'm fine. You know, Oh, here's now there's two hands. It's a, it's a whole other way of living where you're learning how to basically be impotent uh, and still survive. It's, it's uh, it's the gelding process. Basically they're gelding you younger so that your full potential will be something that really can't even run. Like the running isn't even a thought in your mind, right? Because you're too, you're, you're just, you're happy enough just walking around, you know, as long as you're leaning on somebody, that's all you'll do your whole life. I, I think that's really pretty much who all of us are right now. So few of us can actually really run or jump. You know, it, it's, we're, we're just learning how to walk really. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's time. It's time to run. You know what I mean? It's th that entire system where, you know, you, you're still at that level where you think if only, if only we can get the right guys in, mm -hmm. then things will change. That's an illusion. Yep. First of all, it will never happen then your so-called alternative media going back to your 9-11 uh, story <clears throat> even they are running the bullshit story saudi arabia unbelievable yeah. what kind of nonsense they are talking and uh, of course you you are not allowed ever to mention israel mm -hmm. in that context yeah. don't you please don't you yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm not saying people haven't connected some dots. They have. But in the larger picture, it just doesn't come together. You know what I mean? I don't think people have connected dots. I, I, I think that what happens is, is people like Bill Cooper, mm. uh, who three months after 9-11 was shot by federal agents after he said 9-11 is going to happen. They're going to blame it on bin Laden. It's going to be something big like a building or something. And boom, they shoot him in the head. His book exposed all of this. And what you're looking at is you're looking at a leak in the boat. And so these people that own this slave ship see that leak that Bill Cooper made and they're using it to their advantage. And what they're doing is, is one of them's coming up and he's whispering to the others, Hey guys, check out this leak. Look what this leak I found. I'm going to expose this whole thing. And that's, that's then used as a way of actually patching that, that leak, making the slaves actually patch it, <laughs> and using that as proof that, that, that I'm going to turn this slave ship around. But you guys are going to have to stay here and keep paddling because if you don't, it'll ruin the whole plan. So, so stay put. And next election, Make sure you vote for potatoes because we're going to use those potatoes in a secret paste and we're going to use that paste to patch another hole to make our ship even more strong so we can get even more slaves on this ship. And everyone's like, that sounds fucking great, man. Where we go one, we go all. Where we go one, we go all. And it's just, it's weird freaking moving on. And this isn't even about Israel. I mean, hear me out. It definitely is Israel. What I mean is this is actually more about Zionism. This mm. is a, a much larger Leviathan that has had its, 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 its beak into everything. There's so many mouths to this creature. There's so many feet and arms and tentacles to it. Mm. And that's why technology of, of belief was written the way it was. It's literally showing you, look, this is just the belly. That, that's all. Over here is one arm. Here's this other tentacle. Here's this other part. Here's this other part. And until we understand that, um, there's when you first bite into this truth, there's a sense of dread because you understand exactly what you're dealing with. You see the belly of this spider. This spider is so big that you can't even fathom its belly. You, you honestly just guy 
and you just naturally assume it's clouds or it's part of the environment. This, this is a large creature because it's had four, five, six thousand years to, to fester and build. This is built right into Judaism. It's built right into Islam. It's built right into Christianity. The revelation, the book of revelations is literally the Zionist plan for a one world government. And that's what my book outlines. It, it, it literally just shows you, look, here's why it works. Here's, here's why this is happening. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, this is not a, this is not a feel good chocolate milkshake kind of book. It's, it's, it, it, but it is invigorating. I swear, because I've outlined how to fix it. I've outlined how you can personally change your own persona and reinvigorate your belief because belief is actually a pranic force. It's a very important force that is in life. And no one talks about that. It's, it's, uh, it's crucial. If you're going to step out of this master slave duality into sovereignty, you're going to have to invigorate your belief system. You're going to have to reemphasize who you are and just how important your beliefs are because um, they don't want us as slaves. This is really interesting, but they don't. In other words, if they did, we would all wake up, we would all be born into lobster cages that were confined to a certain area. We would have chains around our neck. It's, they don't want us as slaves. They want us as belief. Uh, mm -hmm. but they want to harvest our belief. That, that belief is, is the most vital pranic honey you could possibly imagine in the world. That they, they move the entire world with our belief. That, that it's more important than anything ever. But we wake up and cheapen our beliefs. We think they don't mean shit. We think they're dangerous. We think that they're bad. We think that it means it's the opposite of reason. But really, it's this underlying prana economy I talk about. It's, it's your essence. It's your life force. And where you choose to give your beliefs um, is going to dictate your future. You only have so much belief to give. You only have 100 prana coins. And, and 40 of them, you're automatically giving to your government unless you stop. And the second you stop, you now have 40 extra prana coins every morning that you wake up that you can put into anything. You can put in your kids. You can put into chickens. You can put into a, a silver. You can put into yourself. You can put into you know, whatever it is. It's, to me, that's the way out. And, and that's what will bankrupt the entire system overnight is if, if people can invigorate, find the fashionable sense of what it's like to actually have their own sovereignty and really get into that groove because it, it's not a chocolate sugar kind of flavor. It's more like a Brussels spout. It's a broccoli. It's a, it's a long-term vibe that you feel that you're like, man, that feels good. Like I, I hate a good meal and I'm, I'm chopping the hell out of this wood right now. It's, it's a different kind of flavor. But again, because we've been crawling, <laughs> we're not, we're, we can't even think in terms of, of, of running. So we're missing out on things uh, by design, basically. I was just thinking, I, I know it will not happen, but let's just say um, we have a lot of hype around the two, uh, 2020 election in the US. Mm -hmm. Let's just say nobody would go and vote. Yeah. I know it will not happen. Yeah, yeah. There, there are too many believers. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> But let's say that that would happen. Do you think they would still announce a result? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. Also, the media would never tell you no one voted. They, mm. you know, they would just say everything's fine. Mm. In fact, they might lie by saying, "Oh, there's a little bit lower turnout than normal." That must mean that that the country has lost faith in the whistleblower. So and so, and, and his, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's only two. Okay, so all news is a f stock trout pond. Mm -hmm. And all of us reporters, me included, are coming to the same stock trout pond, and we're sticking our pole in that water, <laughs> and we're <laughs> hoping for a fish. And when we catch a really big fish, we're making money from that fish, but that fish isn't truth. All of that fish comes from the same, there's a truck. A truck freaking comes twice a week. And one truck says AP, the other truck says Reuters. And it literally dumps the fish into that pond that we then go and fish from. 
So what you're looking at when you're looking at, oh, he's big news, you're just looking at the guy that caught the biggest fish out of that same pond. It's sovereignty. The reason why I have such a low viewer count is not because I'm not magnificently entertaining. <laughs> it, it, I'm trying to be funny, by the way. It, I'm telling you, the reason why is because I'm not pulling fish out of that same pond. Mm. People are not used to, they're, they're like, James, you brought home this fucking eel. What, what is this weird thing? Or I'm you know, bringing home shark fin or, or, or grouper, like really weird stuff that they've never seen. Mm. There's not an appetite for it. There's mm. not a, uh, it's not in the zeitgeist yet. So people like me are, are really having a hard time staying alive. And this is not a new phenomenon. This is yellow journalism. William Randolph Hearst perfected this, but even it, it definitely predates him. It, it's the, the people that are holding the information have known for a long, 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 long time how important having the information is. There's a really big naivete that comes with people thinking that somehow a, a good person could penetrate into DC and then raise through the ranks and then at the very end um, slay the beast. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really poor, poor fantasy that's brought on by the Stockholm. It has nothing to do with character. It, it, Trump, Trump was probably a really great, awesome guy. He, I, I actually think he still is. But I think that Trump sees this is how the system works. This is how th this happens. If I'm going to be president, I'm going to have to have the Zionists elect me. And if the Zionists want me to elect them, I'm going to have to do a few things so that they can trust me. It's just the simple it, – it, people that, that – psychopaths can't trust other psychopaths. Mm. It's just impossible because they know how evil they each are. The only way they can trust each other is through blackmail. Blackmail is not like a, oh, it's a weird thing that happens accidentally. Blackmail is a very effective method for psychopaths to trust each other. It, it's, it's crucial, in fact. It, it's the most important thing you could possibly have invented if you were a psychopath is blackmail because it allows two people that are evil to enter into a contract with each other where exposing the other becomes the punishment if they were to break or breach the contract. I'm saying all this because Trump um, would have had to have entered into a blackmail situation in order for the Zionists to trust him. It's not about, oh, well, he's able to just say truth that shocks people. No, it doesn't work that way. They physically <laughs> wouldn't put him on camera unless he first participated in some sort of a blackmail ceremony so that they could know that. Mm. Now, this is a speculation, Judith, but I think that blackmail ceremony was a commercial. Donald Trump in 2012, the same year he, he, uh, he uh, trademarked MAGA, Make America Great Again, he filmed a commercial for CERTA, CERTA mattress commercial. And in this commercial, he is outside of the hotel with sheep, <laughs> the <laughs> archetype of sleeping humans. He's with sheep, and there is a sheep that says nine and a sheep that says 11, and they are both on top of, of towers, of these little columns. Mm. And Donald Trump is giving them a thumbs up on video. Oh. Now, now it, it's, I wrote an article about this, by the way. It's called Five Examples of Elite Blackmail. And this is just one. This isn't like an anomaly. This is just how you do business, okay? I think that Trump was, was required to shoot that commercial. Very much like Epstein has a painting of Bill Clinton in a Monica Lewinsky dress. The painting... <laughs> is something that you can carry around in public. It's a public key. You can show people that. In other words, uh, Wexner, who owned Epstein, can show that painting of, of, of Clinton and basically negotiate. By selling that painting for $7 million, what you're really doing is you're buying the blackmail photograph of Bill Clinton in that dress. And the only reason why Bill Clinton would get in that dress is by agreeing beforehand in exchange for access into dc and i think that certain mattress commercial is trump's that's the public card the private card i think is is he's inside that same hotel room and he's filming one thing else he's saying i know 9 11 was an inside job um and i'm not going to say anything about it like like that's that's all it would take 
to own Donald Trump because his public persona would be exposed in, a, in an instant by playing this tape of him. It, it, does that make sense? Have I explained that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> and another way you can look at it, they played the Trump card, mm -hmm. you know? And then yeah. you have this TV series, House of Cards, yeah. And the Trump card, I'm not really a, I'm not really into playing cards, but as far as I remember, um, all rules are off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Trump card trumps everything, correct? Yeah. yeah. That's what Trump mm -hmm. literally means in bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will beat anything ahead of time. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a good observation. In fact, Trump's is also a tarot thing uh certain cards are trump cards too in the tarot so mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot of symbolism to to all of this uh, that's why you're seeing king cyrus is trump that's why the media is calling him king cyrus uh, trump actually wears orange makeup um, it took me a while to realize that um, people don't understand that all of our male politicians wear makeup and trump actually wears makeup for a very archetypal reason just like in Rome, Caesar would put on red makeup on his face before he entered the, the, the city as a triumphant. Isn't that interesting? As a triumphant. Now Trump mm -hmm. is parading through the city of the world with orange makeup as the King Cyrus, as the one who's going to allow the third temple to be built. And that's really where Zionists are in this whole, in this whole crazy thing, is that they're working on this third temple. They're working on uh, supporting the inner church, which is Judaism, because in exchange for that, Judaism would then treat them better as the outer <laughs> church. Yeah, it's insane. It, isn't that it's, so okay? Weird. So here's how it works: you've got <laughs> you've got a bunch of of people that are called chosen people, and they're telling all the other people, "We're the chosen people, and when our chosen of of the chosen people, when our real Messiah comes." He's going to make all of us chosen people in charge of all the people that are not chosen. Yeah. And so that's why we all have to work on it. So it's really this insane game of narcissism, of like, of religious induced narcissism, of like, no, you're the special one. Oh, well, yeah, you're special, even more special than this. And the only reason why I'm special is because we have an outer church of goyim, of non special people that can, can serve the rest of us. I mean, that's how insane it is. Yeah. Well, no savior coming. Maybe a stage savior. Oh, you're the savior. You, you're, we are our own savior. That's of the thing. Of course we yeah. are. Yeah. Of course we are. Yes, a savior could come. You know, people say all oh, your stuff so negative, James, because it's so. But actually, no. There, there is a way out of this, and that way out is through sovereignty. When we pull our belief off that fish pond. They're going to keep stocking it with bullshit fish and no one's going to eat it anymore. And that's going to kill their business overnight. We'll start hunting, you know, in the woods again. We'll start bringing home deer or whatever kind of crazy game. We have mm. to get away from this pond. We have to get away from the stock fish pond. Mm. I, re I remember I told you once that uh, Michael Black, who had a YouTube channel, the Scottish yep. guy who, if memory serves, has a background in intelligence. <laughs> that he always explained that this phrase draining the swamp is yeah. Pentagon talk, is intelligence talk for the little people, for Joe Sixpack. That if they use that phrase, they are not talking about the cabal or the, the pedophiles or you know what I mean. And a couple of days ago, I've read an article. It's an older one. It talked about that global governance will come either by consent or conquest. Something like that was the headline. And they explained that um, the nation states will give over their sovereignty to the UN. And then one sentence just, and then it said, America first. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so here we have two phrases that Trump always uses 
draining the swamp and America first. Yeah, mm. maybe there is a slight surprise in it. Yeah. There maybe. Are 16, <clears throat> I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just agreeing with you. It, you know, there are 16 countries right now that are in revolt, that, that you know, are yeah. actively on the in revolt. And uh, if you trace back what Hillary Clinton did to Honduras, <laughs> what America did to Venezuela, um, what we did to Haiti, what, what, since World War II, America has invaded a new country every 15 months. I'm sorry, let me correct that. Invaded or bombed. That, to me, that's the same. But either we've invaded yeah. them or we've bombed them every 15 months. Every 15 months since World War II. That shows you this slow rolling Leviathan that moves slow enough where no one's going to notice. No one's going to point up and go, hey, look, that, that's not the sky. That's its freaking belly. That's, that's literally what's happening now. And all these 16 countries that are revolting, um, I keep saying this over and over again. People are going to beg for the new world order. They already are. They're going to beg for it. They're going to mm. hope. They're going to hope Trump does it. That's why Hong Kong is pretending to say Trump liberate us. I say pretending because those are Steve Bannon induced uh, riots. Mm. Same thing that happened here. Mm. The migrant horde from Honduras was a device that helps Trump. That was a new world order uh, device used to reinvigorate the wall. The wall is something that the new world order is fine with. They're, 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 they have no issues with that. It doesn't help anyone. It doesn't hurt anyone. It's, once they have 5G, they have everything they need. So it's, it's, there's no struggle, Judith. This is not a struggle. We're not, we're not in the, the grips of a rebel insurgents trying as hard as it can to fight off the evil Death Star. That's not even happening. The Ewoks are literally have signs going, please, Empire, come, come, rape my children. Come, take my wife, take all my house, take my hut. It's, that's what's happening right now. There's only a few of us that are like, what the hell's going on? And the other Ewoks are looking at us like we're the problem. Like, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're rude, the empire won't land. And they won't give us, you know, Soylent Green or whatever, you know, whatever <laughs> else it is. It, that's what's happening right now. And it shows you just how bad it is. Because slavery is such an appealing um, fruit yeah we are we are the rude ones we are we are the problem yep. Mm -hmm. yep heroes are painted as oh well the heroes usually cheered on no the heroes people throw tomatoes at the hero the whole time it's the hero that does it no matter what if the hero will keep going no matter how many people say stop it, you know it's 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 that's what a hero is it's it, it's right now we're pretending oh this abc news anchor was a hero because she tried to release an Epstein story and they question. <laughs> and my response is, is that why didn't you just publish that yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, seriously, what is wrong with you? How can you sleep at night knowing that this is happening and you're just going to go along with what your boss says? Like, it, can't you, can't you start a blog? Have you not heard of WordPress? Have you not heard of YouTube? Did you realize you could become an independent reporter right now with this story, with this one story could create a whole new media empire where you could be pushing truth. And it says she's on the camera like, yeah, man, I got screwed. It was terrible. I mean, I went back to work, but it was terrible. And we're supposed to pretend that this is, this is the truth. This is the great awakening. The great awakening now is dangling a pedophile in front of all of us. And they didn't even dangle it. Think about it. Epstein was arrested 11 years ago, 11 years years ago that means for 11 years we've had the opportunity to build a narrative to turn this into an excuse to where how can we make this yeah we can usher this in then we'll pull out assange he'll be act two uh we'll have this whistleblower stuff but in in between we need to have some impeachment threats we need to pretend like that trump's just he's so close to overturning the swamp but everyone's just fighting him they're just they're fighting him so you're looking at a wrestling match and you've got a literal blonde hulk hogan in one corner trump and now you have these three other guys, the, the three banditos, and they're cheating. They're throwing sand in his face. They're jumping into the ring at the same time. They're holding Trump down. He can't get up. And we're all stuck just rooting for him, cheering for him. Again, it's two towers. It's, it's two freaking towers. It's a false good guy and a false bad guy. And we're stuck in between. And, and it's been going on for thousands of years. 
it's so and it obvious. it still works. <laughs> yeah. It's so, once you see it, it's amazing how blatant the camouflage is. But mm. like, it's just such an obvious in your face thing once you see it. But until you can see it, that's why I've, I wrote Technology of Belief because it, it's, it's, it isn't mind control, it's chemical control. That was my last book really focused on that. I know I called it Blueprints of Mind Control, but I kept explaining this is about chemicals because I couldn't, I couldn't write a book saying Blueprints of Chemical Control. People would not understand what I meant by that. Th this mind control that we have is chemical control. It's a comfort control. It's, it's, uh, it's all about comfort. When someone gets into uh, dissonance, they, if you can shut off the, rep, the mammalian brain through lies, you're stuck with a reptile now. A reptilian brain doesn't, doesn't feel a threat from things that are familiar. Um, a scorpion could show up inside a reptilian brain. And if that scorpion had been there the whole time, he would not see it as a threat. This is like bona fide science. He, he, he literally would not respond to, to that because it's not something unique. It's not something new. There's a way to fool the reptilian brain very easily. And the key is you need, to, you need the, the mammalian brain, the neocortex to shut off. And the only way you're gonna shut it off is just fill it full of lies. If you can get enough lies in there, they become more impulsive. And when we're impulsive, we're more stimulated by comfort and by familiarity. We, we breed familiarity with our environment, even if it's a scorpion. It's like, well, if he hasn't killed me yet, he's no danger now. That, that's literally what the, the limbic brain goes through when it, when it thinks about that stuff. So is it, it's fear part of what keeps us supporting the system, buying into the illusion? Um, it's definitely, uh, so it starts with comfort. Mm. We have to get comfortable. And in order to keep comfort, that does require a lot of work. That's why you have politicians. It requires a lot of work to make it comfortable enough for us to stay. I think primarily it's comfort. The, and then on top of that, what's next after the comfort is, is the, the shame that's placed on showing your own pride, on raising your own ego. It, it requires an ego to stand up in the bottom of the Viking ship and say, I don't want to, I don't want to, Paddling. I'm not rowing anymore. <laughs> yeah. That requires a very strong ego. And mm. we live in a society that shames the ego. That's constantly saying, well, no, you're too full of yourself. You're too, you, you think too highly of yourself. And it's actually, if you were to think highly of yourself, you would then be in charge of your own airspace, of your own militia, of your own food, of your own EPA. You, you would want to be in charge of yourself more. That's why it's so important that, that they shame us all the time on TV. If they didn't do that all the time, it would be a lot harder to maintain this system of control. Everything that you see that happens that, that we call evil is actually practical. Mm. Like, what I mean is that there's actually a, a bona fide reason why a rancher would, would install this at the ranch. Like, he, he's not playing music to us out in the, the corral to make us feel better. He's playing music because there's a, a bona fide scientific reason that that music causes, that makes his job easier to maintain us. And, and as soon as you understand that that's how it works, everything becomes crystal clear from there. And actually, that's what I write about the book. You actually end up feeling better. It's that first initial bite that you're like, oh God, this is awful. But really, once you can see it, it it's, it's so much more comfortable because you don't have to waste all your time going, hey, did, did they just open up a new a new secret hatch here? Or did they just add a new salt lick here? You, you, you can start to see the narrative so much more clearer. And that actually makes you more, you burn less calories. You're, you're wasting less time uh, desperate in the, oh, what is Q, QAnon gonna post? What's gonna happen next? Or, or what did the ABC reporters say? Or, or what did this happen? You now have a lot more energy and focus that you can use to literally raise chickens, to, find a way to stop using the petrodollar to uh, find a way to uh, defund the cabal as much as possible. Um, things like that start to rise to the surface because you have more calories to burn. Yeah. I think it's about our energy on many levels. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, our energy, our belief 
is what is feeding the system. And we keep voting, we keep telling ourselves all funny stories <laughs> that, yeah. um, hey, that is your duty as a good citizen. You have to vote. What are you talking about? And we even have some so-called anarchists uh, or libertarians or whatever that are planning to run for offices themselves, <laughs> be it mm. for mayor or whatever. Yep. So, yeah, okay. You are still buying into the illusion, thinking by you getting there, you could change it from within. Yeah. Mm -mm. yeah. The, the controllers of this reality field, they didn't give you the tools to change it. And they surely didn't give you the tool to vote in your liberator. Of course. And on top of that, some of those people who are planning to run for whatever, I don't care how minute that position is, it's still buying into the system. And some of them are completely traumatized and unhealed, mm -hmm. cannot even fix their own lives but they will fix it for you out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, makes total sense. And <clears throat> that is another thing, this externalization thing that we have going. It, it's always out there. If we fix that, then things will uh, get better. But yep. hardly anybody is looking at Maybe I should fix myself first. Yep. I've been uh, trading, um, trading books for, for silver. Mm -hmm. I, I, like I don't want to take petrodollars anymore. You know, I mean, I will. I'm not saying I won't because I need to survive. Yeah. But I've been really working hard to, uh, to encourage people to, to use silver. Um, it, it's another example of how your belief ends up leaving the, the false system. You're, you're literally comparing the weight of a piece of silver to a quarter, to a piece of change. You, you understand this is a false metal. <laughs> this is a real metal. Mm. Um, it's, these are all things that we can do to invigorate and remember. Uh, we have to tap into our ancestors too. That's a really important one. Um, I encourage everyone to go out and ground, physically stick your feet into the dirt. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a serious power that comes from the ground. More importantly, your ancestors. If you could find um, any of your family that's buried and place your feet in that ground, I, I, I'm telling you, this is a bona fide science. We've known this for years and years and years. You were able to tap into your ancestors and draw power that you didn't even know that you had. This is why the migration programs are so important, Judith, because if they get us migrating, they're able to cut off our psychic cord that connects us to the ground. I, I don't want anyone here to misunderstand and think that I'm talking about this in a superficial way. I'm literally talking about literal energy, real pranic energy that does come up. And I see this because I know people that go visit their, their relatives in a cemetery. They are charged from that experience. They are literally feeling different because of that. There is a real power when we tap into our ancestors. There is a real power when we see the power of our beliefs, see the power of our prana as it's flowing through us. Um, that's something I've really tried to focus on in the book because I don't want, I don't want readers to, to get into that and then feel stuck. Mm. Uh, you're going to leave hopefully with the exact opposite feeling. You're going to, but you're going to notice this is going to take some calories. I'm going to have to stand up and say, I'm not rowing anymore. And that, that is, that is an effort. It's an effort where the ones who have made it look themselves in the eye and go, I'm a fucking badass. Like I, I did that, you know, it, it's, there's a new power that comes from that. But um, as you go through that, people are going to throw tomatoes at you. And those, the, the people that are throwing tomatoes are going to be the ones that are pretending to be the liberators. <laughs> Literally, those are the ones that are going to throw the tomatoes at you the most. That's mm -hmm. what's happening with QAnon. 
when I, when I uncovered that QAnon was Steve Bannon and listed the timeline and showed all these different steps, it shows, look, this, he is the CEO of QAnon. I was completely ostracized. I was called selfish. I was called evil. I was called uh, uh, negative. I was called all these things because I was just pointing out the truth. Mm. It's, it, this is very real. And I picture other people trying to go through that same kind of shame that I had to go through. And it's not fun. But it's like a boot camp. You'll come out the other side and you'll be that much more powerful. It, it, you'd be amazed at how much more powerful you will feel and you will emanate. It, it, it's, that's what we all need to do. We need to do that alchemy and face these people. I, my, my last video, I called them out by name. There's so many agents out there that are distributing toilet wine hope. These are people that have been, the, the rower has, has brought by, the slave master has brought by peaches. And these people have kept the peaches in their cheeks. And then at night, they're sticking them behind the toilet and they're fermenting them into wine. And they're selling you that wine. They're selling all of us at the slave ship that wine. And they are profiting from our slavery. And those people are the ones that right now are pushing QAnon, but won't, won't release stories where I say, look, here's how QAnon is banning. They want you to pretend that it's an invisible person. And I've called these people out. And that's why I keep getting attacked. That's why I keep losing my audience. But this is the only way we're going to find this. We have to make it expensive for people to lie to us. Because mm. right now, it's so profitable. People are making so much money on Twitter right now lying to you, selling you false hope, pretending to offer you a solution if you just trust the plan more, or if you mm. just watch the next video, or if you focus on Epstein. It's, it's all these are lies. These are toilet wine. And that's why we're doing so bad because the toilet wine is so profitable. I, imagine me, I'm bringing fresh water in. No one wants that. They're like, well, this doesn't taste like peaches at all. You know, <laughs> and it's like, you're trying to play. I know this is going to hydrate you. And they're like, but I want to be drunk. And you're like, I want you to be hydrated. It, it's a completely different, uh, different economy. That's why I said earlier that, look, you, if you really want to know the truth, people like slavery. Most people just like it. it. It requires a lot. It requires a lot of self-respect and self-love to say, I don't want slavery anymore. Mm. And most of us don't have that. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Being under the radar can be a blessing as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you can get away with a lot more. Yeah. And uh, because being under the radar also means you are not on the radar of YouTube. Mm hmm no, not in the way that, you know, some channels are, they release a video and 10 minutes later, they have like 100,000 views. Yeah. Yeah. On Twitter right now, um, mm -hmm. there is an account. It's a picture of a Q with an owl and its eyes. He's got 300 followers and he'll post uh, something really generic, like where we go, when we go off. And, and he, within 15 minutes, He's got like 3,000 retweets, likes, and, and hearts. That's not an exaggeration. I, mm. I, I, because I'm trying to spread my message, I, I have no choice but to pay attention to my effects on social media. It's something I have to watch. Mm. Um, I was telling Judith before we started this, I, I have the same number of followers now that I did in April. And what happened was is that in April, I released a story where I exposed who I think QAnon was with timeline, dates, research, and all I did was get thrown tomatoes at. And all those people did was unfollow me and say, we're punishing you. We're punishing you because you're ruining the toilet wine. So th this is a, um, a very difficult way of working and finding it. And that's, that's why I've been focusing on my books because if I can sell, if I can keep it in outside the internet as a pulp nonfiction, you know, it's, that's really the way to slip under the radar because my stories are very emotionally charging. So they, they feel like pulp, but it's still nonfiction. It's not pulp fiction, it's pulp nonfiction. It's truth that's hidden inside of this emotional pulp. And, and I, I'm under the impression that that's the best way for someone like me to still convey that message and still, you know, still tell the truth without it being... Uh, uh, my hope is, is that if I ever do get big enough where they start to punish me, it'll be too late because I'll have all these fictional works that are out that don't really fit into the genre, you know, where someone can just instantly or easily shut that off. It, it's a, I don't know if we'll have to find out. I'm still, I'm still new at this. So. 
yeah, yeah I did, did. you're a little bit uh, like me so you know i i just start and then i figure things out as i go you know what i mean yeah, it's definitely a strategy on the field mm. um i've tried different tactics i've tried different strategies and uh i'm just learning as i go seeing what what's the most effective so mm. yeah another thing that sometimes is talked about, I don't see that happening, is the great American uprising. Mm -hmm. The, um, oh, we cannot give up our guns. And no, I'm not saying give them up. I'm not saying that, yeah, D don't do that voluntarily. That's nonsense. But honestly, if push is coming to shove, I don't see the great American uprising. I don't see. No, it. I, I I think a lot of people would give them up if, if it came to. Oh, you're confiscating your guns now. Um, and yes, there might be pockets of uprising here and there. I'm not saying it's not going to happen at all, but in the sense that some people are promoting it, mm. you know. Nobody was shocked into reality after 9 11. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, what are we waiting for? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think that'll ever happen. I think we're too chemically uh, subdued. Mm. Not, only in, not only brain chemicals like serotonin, but also in our pharmaceuticals and in our food. <laughs> I, I, I think it would take a I mean, look at what Antifa was trying to do. I think that really gave them a gauge that, you know, look, we can set the streets on fire. We can cover them in, in human feces and it's still not going to work. Like it, it, and that's why the school shootings are continuing. Mm. That's, that's, why, um, that's why I know, that's why I know that Trump is not on your side. Oh. Because if Trump was on your side, Parkland would have been proof Sheriff Israel would have been arrested or the Secret Service people that were at the school. Why were Secret Service people at a school during a drill where a freaking gunman happened to break out? What a it's, coincidence. It's, <laughs> if, if Trump was really on our side, one, one of those low-level goons would have been in jail. That would have sent such a powerful message to people like me that are looking for any kind of signs of hope to say, yes. This is going to happen. I'm going to keep rowing. And I would have kept rowing. I mean, I'm just telling you that that, that, that would have worked for me. Mm. But instead, the exact opposites happened because then we had Vegas. And then you have Dalton and you had California and you had New York. There's been four or five other shootings since then. Mm. And, it's, and instead, what's happened is now we're talking about red flag laws, about pre-crime, where now we're going to predict who's going to shoot a gun. Mm. And still the same people are like, I said, trust him, man. This is going to work out. I know he's talking about taking away our guns, but he's just a deploy. Just like they say when Trump says everyone has to get their shots. I raise my hand saying, that's bullshit, y'all. And everyone else is saying, hey, don't, don't call him bullshit. He has to tell us to get our shots because it's the only way he can sneak around and do this secret stuff for no one is looking. <laughs> and I'm just like, you're, you're freaking high, aren't you? Well, like you are so freaking high right now. Yeah, wishful thinking is strong. It's it's so bad. But that's what I mean by it's these are this is not a reasonable thing. This is not someone who's reasoned their way into this. Mm. They want slavery, Judith. This person yeah. wants yeah. slavery. Mm. And they see me as threatening that. They don't see me as helping. They see me as threatening. They want that peach wine. They don't mind rowing. Their Oprah's on. There's a giant TV right above where we have to row. So why would we get up? And what are we going to do? Jump off the side of the boat and swim? That's crazy, James. Who the hell's mm. going to do that? Where are we going to go? That, that's, what's, that's what's happening. Mm. That's actually why it's funny because that's what uh, um, Billy Budd, that's what being impressed literally was. You, you, were, you were caught in a bar <laughs> and you would wake <laughs> up drunk on a boat the next day. And for eight months, you now work on that boat. Why? Because what are your alternatives? What are you going to do? You can just jump overboard and just swim home? You know, it, it's, no, it's too late for that. 
So it's, it's, this is how the Stockholm works. It's, this has been set in stone since JFK, like even before then, but I'm just talking about like in my life, the things that I physically notice. this has been happening since JFK. 9-11, that's why it's so insane for me that people are thinking that 9-11 was a one-off. Like it was just this one-time thing and now no one's going to do it anymore. They're like, oh, we, we got away with it. Wow, let's quick, let's run home. Let's never do it again. It's like, no, what are, you, what are you kidding? No one's been punished. Why would they not do it again? Why would they not go, well, shit, if we can do that, what else can we do? Like it, 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 there's no logical thought to this at all. None. It, it's, that's how bad it is. It's people wanting slavery. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and also when I think of uh, the great American uprising, you certainly know about um, sound weapons, what they use during crowd control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, okay, that is what they are publicly showing us. Who knows what else they have in the back of. Yeah. Oh, I'm so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah but, or um, with these uh, laser weapons, they torch an entire area. Hmm. Yeah, wh what are you going to shoot at? Yeah. Yep. In California right now, they're basically sacrificing the entire state. Yeah. Fire rituals mass migration mm. um, and the government governor brown isn't saying oh we're gonna have to come together he's saying no this is the hell on earth this is the new normal <laughs> those are exact quotes this is yeah, the new and normal. It, it's your fault because of yeah. climate disruption yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly yeah you brought this all on yourself because you are driving cars you're breathing you are having babies. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is, yeah. Yep. It's bad. It's bad. Some, it's bad. Sometimes but that's what you get. If you're going to be a slave, if you're going to get it, if you're going to be a slave, you're going to have to feel shame about yourself. You're not going to be a good slave if you're not. It's, yeah. that, and again, that's why I'm saying this isn't even them being cruel. This is them just saying, well, look, if you want to be my slave, okay, but here's how it goes. You're going to have to think shit about yourself. Cause I don't want, I don't want to invest in new bits in your mouth. I don't want to freaking buy this nice big screen TV and have you get up and want to be free tomorrow. You can't do that. Mm. It's a symbiotic relationship. And, and we're not even dealing with the Stockholm. We're dealing with the children of Stockholm. Like that's, <laughs> what, that's how much worse it is, is that we are the people that were raised in the Stockholm. Mm. And that's, it's, it's, that's why it's such a, it's such a losing battle in the sense of you're not going to be able to win by fighting the system. The only way you're going to be able to win is just to cut off DC entirely and just say anyone who's pushing. Okay. So the first litmus is nine 11 was nine 11 an inside job or not, at least for America. That's your first litmus is someone lying to you or are they telling you the truth? Asking was, was nine 11 an inside job. The mm -hmm. second is can DC fix this? That's your second litmus. Cause anyone who says DC can fix this is not going to fix it. They're, 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 no, that's exactly how it's not going to be fixed. The only way this happens is through um, by what I call localism, bioregionalism, something I've been pushing a lot. I've written an entire model. It's in my book, actually, showing people here's how this solution would work. Because I don't want people stuck without solutions. I want them to know that if they get up and say, I'm not rowing anymore, that once they jump overboard, there's, they're not alone. There are other people that are in the water, too. They found doors. They found old rowboats. They found flotsam and jetsam. They've cloned together life rafts. And they've developed their own civilization on the floating water. And, and it's good because no one there is shaming anyone else. Everyone's working together. It's a different kind of, we don't even have oars, you know, it's, we're not something that we're trying to go somewhere. We're just trying to survive. It's a different kind of life. It's a Mad Max on the water, but you're alive. You're free. You're, you're one of us. You, you, you don't want to go back to the ship. And say, can you please put that shackle back on me so I can watch Oprah? <laughs> so I can drink toilet water, you know? Yeah. But that requires some guts. Yeah, it does. And that's why anyone who's done that is a badass in my eyes. Mm. And that's really how we fix it. Because you make it fashionable to want to get up. 
right now it, it's it's teetering you know Half, most of them are like it's not fashionable but it is it, it's also the the most amazing thing you could do for yourself is to divest from from this system from dc if you're an american if you if you divest from dc that's the most amazing power empowering thing you can do for yourself is to yeah. say I, I don't i don't i don't know these are criminals and just yeah. recognize what it, what it truly is I've written an article about that. It's also in the book. It, it explains how government is a secret society living in the open. The mafia has something called a muerto. It's this code where no mafia will ever tell on another mafia. The government has the same code. It's called classified information. It's literally the exact same code of conduct, which is we're going to protect each other. We're not going to let any, any of these non-made people, you know, in the mafia, you're made. In, in government, you're elected. It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same system. It's a secret society out in the open. It's the mob that's coming around saying, we will protect you from the mob by you giving us protection money. It's the exact same racket. It's, it's, it's worse. It's actually worse than the exact same racket because the mafia, at least they carry themselves like, yeah, we're the bad guys. This is the government. They're pretending to be the hero the whole time. It's sick. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and um, <clears throat> how can I say this? It feels as if the walls are closing in. Yeah. Yeah. And it is not that complicated, but we definitely have to withdraw our energy, our thoughts, emotions. It's so emotionally charged, that entire thing, that subject. And that is what they need. Mm -hmm. our, our thoughts, emotions, and I can't wait to see it on Twitter. <laughs> you know, when the uh, election goes into the hot phase, how they are going to fight tooth and nails over their two idiots. Yeah. Yeah, Trump will win. Will win re-election. Yeah, and uh, um, I would imagine he'll crack open Clinton finally. Clinton and Assange will be part of that. Mm. And uh, if if the N NWO thinks they can pull it off, I think the Clinton Foundation will be the investigation, which creates a one-world court. I think uh, he'll be able to. Trump will be able to say, the Clinton Foundation is so corrupt, and they're international. That there's no way. See what happened to Epstein? See how they got to him and we couldn't stop it? Well, that's why we need a one world court now to prosecute this Clinton Foundation. Like, this is how I think possibly this would happen. Mm. And now you have a president, you have someone who's been promising to be America first the whole time, now telling everybody we need to have this court case in, in Israel inside yeah. the Rothschild one world court that's already been built. There's already. And we need to go there so we can try this case internationally. And it might not seem like much, but that's, that's, that's very important because now the psyche, the zeitgeist thinks that the, the only way to save things is through an international uh, tribunal, international court. And that's, that's when you're seeing the ceiling erected over all of us. Uh, Space Force is Donald Trump's overarching, it's not even Trump's, it doesn't belong to him. Space Force is the New World Order's overarching government that will, that will come in above us, basically. Um, mm. it, it, that's why we don't have control over our own airspace. In fact, civilians aren't even allowed to fly above 50,000 feet. Meanwhile, the stratosphere is like, what, 300,000 feet? I mean, it's probably even more than that. It's like most of the sky, civilians aren't even allowed to be in. So we, we have no idea what they're building, what they're doing. Uh, that is reserved for the aliens and for, <laughs> and for covert uh, military planes. Yeah. yeah, I think eventually they'll have the ability to broadcast uh, mm. giant images over the sky. Um, and then, then it'll really just be over, over. Like it, it'll seriously, it'll be over, over at that point. Yeah, but you are correct. This uh, international court... In mm -hmm. Israel, that might very well be the first step of America first. America that's what gives I, up its sovereignty first. 
Yeah, that's what I would do. If I was the New World Order, I would prop America up as this independent, like we're fighting for it all, this is the way it is. And then I would make America the new paladin of the world, the new, um, it, it's no, in fact, America is, is anti New World Order, which is why you need to all be under America's blanket. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, I mean, it's such a obvious ploy, but it will work and people will beg for it. They already are. People will beg for the New World Order because they are. They're out there right now begging for it. Yeah. So what would you suggest to people? What would be good steps? If, it, <clears throat> if they wanted to, let's say, change their point of view, work on themselves, um, if they feel there is something to this, what we have discussed, where could somebody start? So I don't know if this is, if this is the same tactic for Europe. Um, mm. I'm only saying that the tactic for America, mm. only just this is what I know. Um, I'm encouraging everyone to stop using the petrodollar, to mm. de devest as much as possible into silver. The reason why I'm picking silver, this sounds silly, but it's actually not. There's, there's such a magical connotation to silver. The silver screen, which is how Hollywood uh, broadcasts and, and hypnotizes everyone. A silver spoon in your mouth. Mm. Silver alkaline. Silver bullets kill vampires and werewolves. Mm. Um, it's, there's so much magical properties to silver. And mm. if you can take your $20 petrodollar, because it's about $20 for a round of silver. If you can turn a $20 bill into a piece of silver, you're actually alchemizing. You're actually creating... <laughs> You're turning a piece of awful shit into something really powerful and valuable, silver. And now, now if everyone had a piece of silver and they kept it with them, they could use it like a talisman. They could charge it with what real money is. And the way to charge it is you just look at it. You just, I got one here and I just look at it. I, I touch it. I feel how heavy it is. And just by doing that, I'm constantly putting prana into this coin, my belief My belief in DC is being sucked out of the $20 bill and being placed in this piece of silver. Mm. And the more, more, the more of us do this, mm. the more we can fight for a decentralized currency for the mm. idea of using a barter type system to stop utilizing the petrodollar. And the key I meant more on a personal level. Well, that's what I'm saying on a personal level. To oh, find okay. I think mm. that if you're holding silver, I think that there's an alchemical uh, power that happens in that. Mm. It's something that you're able to go back to and hold as a vessel for your belief. Mm. While that's happening, you need to find new, once you do that, once you have your piece of silver, you'll notice it's contagious and you'll mm. start to want to eliminate all, all efforts you have that go into the petrodollar. Mm. And that's going to be something that's going to be a, a never ending task. It's not something you're going to do overnight. It, it, it might start with chickens. Well, I, I like to eat eggs, for example. So if I had my own chickens, I wouldn't have to buy, I wouldn't have to have petrodollars to buy eggs. I could just grow them, you know. Anything I can do that I can survive where I'm not using the petrodollar is, is a really powerful thing in America, in my opinion. Um, that also includes not ingesting news, not ingesting um, any of their information, any of their propaganda. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot to develop my own content as much as I can. Even though I, sadly though, I do talk too much about Epstein and about things, but it's because I'm trying to bring more people in. Um, mm. But just divesting in as much ways as you can, uh, putting things back locally into the soil, touching your feet in the ground, tapping into your ancestors, really mm. all the things I've said, this is how you do it. Learn how to, to go a week without ever having to think about DC, where, where your entire world is around you, you know, your neighborhood, your, your, your yard, your house, all that stuff. Mm. Uh, that's all I can think of right now to do. Um, but those seem to really help. Yeah. And um, I do have silver coins. Not only one. <laughs> And, I think it's a start. I, what? I think it's a start. I think it's a really important start. And, and there's, if you don't have a place to hold your sovereignty, if you don't have a physical vessel for it, mm. you're going to lose it. You're going to forget it. But if you buy that silver and you're thinking about it in this way, every time you see it, it's going to remind you of that. It's mm. going to put you back on that, that focus again of how can I become more sovereign? Yeah. I've had them for years. 
and I just keep them. Mm -hmm. And um, but actually, I shifted my focus more on, you know, cleaning out confusion and how can I decipher what's nonsense and wh wh mm. what does really make sense, letting the common sense grow more inside of me, um, cleaning out my own trauma, be it childhood trauma or other things, uh, what is going on. And um, yeah, and one thing that is very important to me, that is laughter. Because evil cannot stand la uh, laughter. And I, I do not mean, ha, 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 that is what we have been told to do. No, I mean heartfelt laughter. Yeah. Evil will crumble. So being happy, being in a good mood, taking care of myself, and really watching the show <laughs> and uh, even sometimes if, if, if it's really horrible you can see the glitches you ca can see the bizarreness you can see the contradictions you know if, if you detach a little bit from the drama don't get caught up in all the drama that's going on that's another important one for me and yeah. uh, that way I can start to laugh. That sounds great. Yeah. I agree. Be because if, if, if you're too serious, that crystallizes everything. Hmm. I'm always told I'm too serious. Um, <laughs> and I'm told I laugh too much. <laughs> I, uh, I can't disagree that I'm, that I'm, I, I, I'm just I'm serious too much. But, mm. uh, um, actually, I'm not serious too much. I'm serious to other people too much. Uh, to me, I'm, I'm just the right amount of serious. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I get it. I, I think that's important. The, the, more, the more you feel dis disabled, disheveled, or, or entrapped, or, or in any way, the more you feel negative about that, the more they win. So um, I definitely don't think there's anything at all helpful in feeling negative about it or feeling... Uh, yeah, disempowered, you know. I, 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 to me, the key is to feel as empowered as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things that I do. Um, yeah. To do that. And, and, and I, say, I say how I feel a lot. I, uh, mm -hmm. I go out of my way to uh, burn my own reputation even. It, it, it doesn't, <laughs> to me, it's worth it. It's, uh, like, for example, if I call out other people, other YouTube personalities that are, that are hiding information, I, I purposely list them. They'll have mm. 10 times the audience I do. It'll really hurt me, but I'm doing it anyway. It's, mm. it's, to me, it's like, it's worth it. It's like, no, I'd rather call people out. And, you know, I, I want it to be expensive to lie to lie. people. Mm. It, it has to be expensive right now. If it's not, this will, this will just stay the way it is. Mm. Yeah. And that, that takes someone who's pretty serious a lot. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, I go into a lot of heated, you know, I, I take a lot of heat for that. And uh, it just ends up making you serious, you know, probably too mm. much. But, yeah. Uh, but it's me, you know, we're all going to have our different flavors we bring to the table. So I don't want to yeah. be all things to all people, you know, I'd rather be the, no, he's the hot sauce. You know, you only want him on certain things, you know, and I, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really on a walk path against anybody mm -hmm. because I think it's, more about us you know if if you can i'm not saying it's wrong what you are doing yeah and, and i i get where you are coming from why you are doing that i mm. i get that um i think i'm more about my personal development and mm -hmm. i sh i share that and um, even if, you know, sometimes people ask about astral attacks, psychic attacks, yeah? 
And what I always will say is you have a say in this. Try to say no. Try to mm. tell them to stay away from you. Mm. What, why do you think somebody has to solve that for you? Mm. Raise your voice. Tell the demon to go fuck himself. Mm. Yeah. Tell the archons, no. The forgotten yeah. word, no. Not, yeah. you, you don't do that to me. You stay out here not in my field, end of story. And it works. And now James is frozen. Ah, there you are. There you are, now you're back. Yeah, I lost you for a bit there. Yeah. Or you used to tell the archons no, and then that was it. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I, in, in, yeah, no matter who it is, you know, just try to use the forgotten word. We do have a say in that. They just want us to think that, oh, they, they are so powerful, I'm under attack from the astral world. Yeah, so what? Yeah, I just, I just, my last live stream actually was about the ego. Mm -hmm. And I explained it as an egoic shell, a force field around your spaceship, and how important that is, and, and, and how shitty we treat it as a society. How we're always, you, you, you can't be psychically attacked if your ego is strong enough. Mm. It, it can't it, it just it won't get in it's it's pointless to do that but still people still don't get me though They're, they'll still say in comments well yeah ego is your best friend and your worst enemy and i'm saying no no you don't understand what what society calls a weak ego <laughs> or what society calls a big ego is someone that doesn't have enough ego they don't have enough egoic force field mm. it's not true that your worst that your that your best friend and your worst enemy is a full tank of gas a full tank of gas will always help. It will never hurt. It, <laughs> your car is never going to do the wrong thing because it had, it had a full tank of gas. Yeah. And if anyone's like, well, what if it exploded? Okay, fine, if it exploded. But that's like a really weird case and you don't have a car anymore after that. So it doesn't even freaking matter. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, there's this notion that we told each other that we have to be leaking ego at all times and that we all have to be wandering around on next to empty. And I'm telling you, that's what makes us slaves. That's what makes us stay and row the boat more. is because mm. we don't have enough of that ego to spend. To say, I'm willing to spend some ego right now, get some tomatoes thrown at me, and say, I don't want to fucking row anymore. Mm. That requires so much ego. Yeah. And that's why we're told the opposite all the time, because they, you know, they don't want us to have that. Yeah. And you can throw as much tomatoes at me as you wish. I'm <laughs> out of here. <laughs> yeah. And I've learned to, to really like tomatoes. You know, it's like it's free food if you catch them just right. You know, <laughs> make a salad out of this stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ah, James, that was refreshing. Mm -hmm. As always, loved it. Yeah, you too. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess this will be for 2019, our last probably who knows and um yeah i will be doing more of these paradigm busters <laughs> and uh, i have some some great guests lined up and uh, you don't have to agree with it just ponder on it if it makes sense on some level and that's okay. So, guys, this was it. Mind flight for today. Take good care of yourself. Stay safe and sound. Bye bye. <laughs>